DNA and malignancy of melanocytes, which are pigment producing cells. And the MAP kinase pathway, which consists of RAS, RAF, NEC, and ERK, is a crucial signaling node for cell proliferation and survival. Um, so there are genetic mutations that drive melanoma genesis almost always activate this pathway. So to give a few examples, um, loss of NF1 function or activating mutations in NRAS or BRAF. Um, and also um, the subject or the melanoma subtype of this talk on um, GNAQ or GNA11 um, mutant melanomas. And although um, GNAQ and GNA11 mutant melanomas represent um, a, the minority of melanoma subtypes, it actually is the most common mutation in uveal melanoma. So uveal melanoma occurs along the uveal tract of the eye, which consists of the choroid, ciliary body, and uh, the iris, and it's the most common um, ocular malignancy. And when we typically think about melanoma, we think of melanoma that occurs on the skin. Um, but uveal melanoma is actually very different from cutaneous melanoma in multiple ways, and I'll give you just a few examples. So as I mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, epidemiology, uveal melanoma is quite rare compared to cutaneous melanoma. In terms of metastatic behavior, uveal melanoma has a propensity to metastasize to the liver preferentially and has a poor five-year survival compared to metastatic cutaneous melanoma. Um, this is most likely due to the fact that there are currently no effective systemic therapy options for metastatic uveal melanoma patients. And this is in stark contrast to patients with metastatic cutaneous melanoma in which um, targeted therapy is available for patients with BRAF mutations and also immunotherapy is quite effective as well. Um, so this may be due to the differences in driving mutations. So um, in cutaneous melanoma, the most common driving mutations are in BRAF or NRAS, um, whereas, like I mentioned earlier, the majority of uveal melanomas have driving mutations in GNAQ or GNA11. So um, GNAQ and GNA11 are homologous genes that encode for G-alpha proteins, which are uh, important for G-protein type receptor signaling. And activating mutations, um, in these genes lead to constitutive activation of multiple oncogenic signaling pathways. So this includes the MAP kinase pathway and also the YAP pathway, which is also a critical oncogenic signaling pathway that is involved in cell proliferation and survival, and also the PI3 kinase and AKT pathway, although the mechanisms of how it's regulated um, in this context is not as clear. And so uh, there have been multiple clinical trials that have used a targeted therapies downstream of GNAQ or GNA11 um, that inhibit, for example, MEK with cellumetinib or trametinib, um, protein kinase C inhibitors with sotristorin, or a combination of these with PR3 kinase pathway inhibitors. Uh, but you, as you can see by the overall response rates and the progression through survivals, um, these clinical trials were considered failures. And so we looked at a panel of human uveal, uveal melanoma cell lines I found that they are also resistant to targeted therapy, um, as expected. So above are the results from a live uh, cell imaging experiment looking at cell confluence over time. And so this is a uh, BRAF mutated cutaneous melanoma cell line. And you can see that over time, um, this cell line is very sensitive to trametinib. So you can see that the cells are not growing, so sensitive to the MEK inhibition. Uh, but when we compare these to uh, multiple uveal melanoma cell lines with either GNAQ or GNA11 mutations, you can see that these cells are still able to grow in the presence of trametinib. Um, this was also seen using another FDA-approved MEK inhibitor called benimetinib. And so our big question is, so how can we sensitize GNAQ and GNA11 mutant melanomas to targeted therapies? And so our initial approach to this was to look at um, a process called autophagy because we had shown um, previously um, in our most recent published work that autophagy is a, a critical component in uh, the resistance of uh, ras-driven cancer, so cancers that have MAP kinase pathway activated. So just to give a quick overview of autophagy, so this is the cell's natural degradation and recycling mechanism. We have defective organelles, proteins, and other cytoplasmic contents get sequestered into an autophagosome. This then fuses to a lysosome, and so then the internal components get degraded and then released as macromolecules to be used for other biological processes. So this is an ongoing process that's always occurring in the cell, but it can be upregulated during times of cellular stress. So for example, during nutrient deprivation. And we can measure autophagy in vitro using a fluorescent reporter assay. Um, um, and then also using flow cytometry. So um, you can see that 
the, the areas marked in red are, indicate cells that have high autophagic flux. So if you look at this graph here, um, these are Keras mutated um, pancreatic cancer cells that have been transduced with this autophagy reporter. And you can see that when we treat with increasing um, doses of trametinib, the MEK inhibitor, there's more red, meaning that autophagy is being induced in these cells. And we further found that this, um, this is a very cell-protective mechanism to avoid cell death, and therefore we, this gave us rationale to target autophagy in combination with MEK inhibition. So one of the most uh, clinically relevant autophagy inhibitors is chloroquine and its analog hydroxychloroquine. So these are um, four aminoquinolines that have been approved for medical use for many decades, first as an anti-malarial drug, uh, but now also for a lot of um, autoimmune conditions. It's a very cheap drug compared to um, pretty much all the cancer drugs, and uh, its toxicity profile is, is well characterized. And the way that it works as an autophagy inhibitor is that it blocks the autophagosome lysosome fusion, and it also slows um, lysosome acidification by um, accumulating inside the lysosome. So, um, so previous work in our lab, um, led by Dr. Conan Kinsey, um, he implanted um, patient-derived xenografts into immunocompromised mice. Um, so this was a uh, keras mutated pancreatic cancer uh, PDX. And so um, looking at tumor volume over time, uh, the different colors represent different treatments. So uh, the green is chloroquine, the red is trametinib, and the yellow is the trametinib and chloroquine combo. And you can see that this combination therapy is the only therapy out of those three that lead to tumor regression. And most significantly, uh, the blue line is uh, gemcitabine uh, abraxane, which is the current standard of care chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer. And you can see that the combination of trametinib and chloroquine uh, seems to be superior to the gemabraxane combo. And so um, he was also able to show this in multiple other cancer types. Um, so this is an NRAS mutated uh, melanoma patient derived xenograft. Again, you can see trametinib and chloroquine has um, to, you see tumor regression, whereas monotherapy you don't. And also in a RAS mutated uh, colorectal cancer PDX. And so uh, most strikingly, uh, Dr. Kinsey was able to treat one of his um, pancreatic cancer patients with trametinib and hydroxychloroquine on a compassionate use basis. And so this is a patient's abdominal CT as of April 2018, right before initiation of the treatment. And his uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, or his pancreatic cancer lesion is uh, highlighted here in red, and his metastatic liver lesions are uh, circled in white. And after only two months of therapy, you can see that um, a lot of his lesions now are undetectable. And so this work has led to two ongoing clinical trials. Um, the first is the THREAD trial, which is trametinib and hydroxychloroquine for patients with uh, pancreatic cancer. So this is led by Dr. Kinsey um, here at HCI. And the second is an NRAS or, or tramchloroquine for NRAS uh, mutated melanomas, which is led by a physician and former PhD student in our lab. Um, she's currently recruiting patients in Lyon, France. So our next major question was um, then will this treatment strategy also work in GNAQ or GNA11 melanoma. So first we took an in vitro approach um, using this OMO 2.5 cell line, which is a GNAQ mutated uh, human metastatic uveal melanoma cell line. And uh, so we did live cell imaging looking at cell death over time. So, uh, sorry, the colors have changed a little bit, but the red now is the trametinib and chloroquine combo. The blue is trametinib and the green is chloroquine and black is untreated. And you can see that the trametinib and chloroquine combo is the only uh, treatment that you see increased cell death. Um, this was the trametinib. The bottom is uh, with binimetinib, which is the other MEK inhibitor. And we found that this is uh, mediated by apoptosis as measured by uh, caspase 37 um, uh, measurements. And it's also synergistic. So we did a synergy assay in which we compare increasing concentrations of chloroquine with increasing concentrations of trametinib. Concentration combinations in blue um, show synergism. And then next we wanted to see whether or not this combination can work in vivo. Um, so we used a hepatic colonization model. The reason we did this is because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, most uveal melanomas that metastasize will metastasize to the liver. So we used um, luciferized OMM 2.5 cells that were injected directly into the liver. So because they're luciferized, we then can monitor tumor burden using bioluminescence imaging. 
and uh, also um, uh, uh, gives us a determination of when we can start uh, treatment. And uh, here's some examples of mice uh, that were injected with the OMM 2.5 cells. You can see that their uh, tumors are uh, highlighted here. And at week one, their tumor sizes are pretty comparable. And then by week four, it's the trametinib and hydroxychloroquine combo that is the only uh, mouse here that you see any sort of tumor regression. So this is a graph of that entire, uh, that cohort of mice for this experiment. Um, so luminospore is a surrogate marker of tumor burden using bioluminescence imaging. So you can see that the um, trametinib hydroxychloroquine combination um, for OMM 2.5 injected um, mice have a decreased tumor burden or delayed tumor growth over time um, compared to monotherapy and also compared to um, temozolomide, which is the current standard of care for metastatic uveal melanoma, it's a, a, a chemotherapy. And the trametinib hydroxychloroquine combo group also had increased survival compared to trametinib alone and other treatments. And so we also used a subcutaneous injection model in which we used um, immortalized melanocyte cells that were transduced with the GNA Q mutation. And so we used this um, in order to use an immunocompetent model. So we're able to inject these into immuno or syngenetic um, black six mice. And you can see again that tumor volume over time with the trametinib and hydroxychloroquine has delayed tumor growth compared to monotherapy and increased survival. We also had um, melanase cells that were um, transduced with a GNA11 mutation, and you see a similar pattern in which the trametinib hydroxychloroquine is able to delay tumor growth and increase survival. So interestingly, when um, we were trying to confirm the mechanism of trametinib and chloroquine in inducing uh, cytotoxicity, we found that um, autophagy-specific inhibition was not sufficient to promote cell death in combination with trametinib, which is very different from what we saw with our pancreatic cancer studies that Alan Kahn and Kinsey did. So we used a genetic model to inhibit autophagy um, using a doxycycline-inducible dominant negative form of ATG4B. So in this um, protein is expressed, autophagy is inhibited specifically. And so um, this is the um, autophagy reporter. Um, when the cells are treated with trametinib, you have an induction of autophagy as expected. When you treat with doxycycline, the dominant negative mutant is expressed and autophagy is inhibited as expected. And even in the presence of chloroquine, uh, sorry, in the presence of trametinib, um, the autophagy is still being inhibited. And uh, what was interesting is that when we combine trametinib and autophagy-specific inhibition, we don't see any increase in cell death that we saw with trametinib and chloroquine. In addition, we used another um, isosomal inhibitor named bapomycin A1. So this has a very similar mechanism of action as chloroquine. And now uh, you can see again that there is no enhanced cell death with trametinib and bapomycin A1. And the com combinations of bapomycin A1 and trametinib was not synergistic. Uh, so this suggests that there is an alternative mechanism of chloroquine that is promoting cell death in combination with trametinib. And so another inter interesting observation that we made is with the tool compound that specifically inhibits G-alpha signaling, so it inhibits the G-alpha protein. And so not surprisingly, because GNAQ is upstream of the MAP kinase pathway, um, the combination of GNAQ uh, inhibition, this is the FR compound with chloroquine, has increased cytotoxicity over time. Um, but what was really interesting is that this was autophagy dependent. So when we utilized the tetracycline inducible ATG4B dominant negative, um, again, uh, with G alpha specific inhibition and um, with doxycycline, there actually is an increase in cytotoxicity. So, so this led us back to looking at GNAQ signaling, again, the canonical signaling pathway and its downstream effectors. And so like I mentioned earlier, we know that it activates multiple oncogenic signaling pathways. What I was studying originally was trametinib, which is only inhibiting the MAP kinase um, node downstream of GNAQ and GNA11. Uh, but if we use a G-alpha specific inhibitor, um, you can see it inhibits YAP signaling and uh, MAP kinase signaling and is autophagy dependent. So this led us to hypothesize or uh, whether or not chloroquine can also be inhibiting YAP as well. And so indeed, that's what we saw. Uh, so these are um, immunofluorescent images of YAP in green. Um, DAPI is staining the nuclei in blue. And so YAP is a um, co-transcriptional activator. So when it localizes into the nucleus, this signifies that the pathway is active. So 
Um, when we treat with the cells which prevent it, we can see that there's more accumulation in the nucleus, meaning that gap is activated. Um, but what's interesting is that when we treat with chloroquine, um, there is less nuclear localization. And um, more importantly, this phenotype was not seen with baphomycin A1 um, treated cells, suggesting that chloroquine has a, another alternative mechanism of potentially inhibiting the app signaling. So finally, we wanted to see whether or not trametinib and YAP inhibition promote cytotoxicity in GNAQ and GNA11 mutant um, cells, and whether or not this is dependent on autophagy. So we use the ATP luminescent assay um, as a measure of cell density. So just confirming that this works, you see that uh, trametinib and chloroquine, the um, luminescence is much lower than monotherapy. And so when we tested um, different combinations of trametinib, um, vertiporfin is a YAF inhibitor, and baphomycin A1, which is a um, lysosomal inhibitor, you can see that with um, trametinib and vertiporfin, there is um, no difference in cell density um, compared to vertiporfin alone. It's when we combine uh, trametinib and vertiporfin and baphomycin A1 um, when we see the uh, actually uh, striking decrease in cell density. So um, this suggests that the, the pleiotropic functions of chloroquine in inhibiting YAP signaling and inhibiting autophagy is important and required for trametinib induced cell death. So just to summarize, um, so I've shown that in GNAQ and GNA11 mutant melanoma, um, trametinib and chloroquine has the potential to be an effective treatment strategy as shown in vitro and in vivo, and that this is due to the requirement of trametinib um, inhibiting MEK and chloroquine um, inhibiting YAP signaling and autophagy. So uh, here are my acknowledgments, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.